you. Well, the song I'm going to sing tonight... <laughs> actually, I saw Hester... Gosh, these lights are bright. I saw Hester during the day, and I said, Hester, I'm on after you today, tonight. And she said, Mr. Weeks, I am so nervous. And I said, Phew, nothing to be nervous about. I thought it was more appropriate saying that than Hester. I'm petrified. <laughs> um, but it's all about, I think it's all about the young people tonight. How fantastic to celebrate all these young people's talents. Um, so this evening is about young people with the odd old person just interspersed. I'm the first interspersed. Um, and when I, when I was thinking about this evening and the talk, I said to my wife, the person who who knows me better than anybody else, I said, I said, darling, I, have you got any advice for me this evening? She said, yes, rather too quickly, I thought. <laughs> she said, don't be too serious. OK, I said, and don't be too boring. OK, I said, and don't go on for too long. So in a, in a hopefully non too boring, non too serious and non too lengthy way, I'd like to talk a little bit about the importance of communication and what can happen when communication sometimes goes awry. Uh, as a head teacher, I have appointed, sorry, I have interviewed hundreds of excellent young people for their first teaching post. And when you ask the question, which I think all head teachers do, why do you want to be a teacher? Virtually all of them say, because I love my subject. Fewer of them will add, um, and I really love working with young people. But far fewer of them will say something like, I like the idea that if I am to get across to a group of children some knowledge or values or some views or some concepts, the level of my success will depend upon how effective I am as a communicator. So in appointing newly qualified teachers, I have often not appointed the person who has the most uh, subject knowledge or the person who has the best qualifications, but I have appointed the person who knows that at the heart of being a teacher, you need to be an effective communicator. And I wish I'd have been aware of that concept myself. When I came down from the north, uh, and I suspect that having been down here for 36 years now, you won't know that I was a northerner, um, because I've m masked my accent so well. Um, but if I'd have known that when I took up my first teaching post as a PE teacher in Hounslow, I probably could have avoided the pretty disastrous start to my career that I had uh, based on not understanding communications. To be fair, six minutes into my career, it was going really well. Um, I was inside the head of PE's office, the person that I, for the next year or two, was going to impress in order to further my career. And that office was inside the changing rooms, the boys' changing rooms. And then the head of PE said, excuse me, I, the children are making a little bit too much noise. I need to go and quieten them down. And I said in my dulcet northern tones, I can do that. <laughs> he said, are you sure? I said, no problem. So I went into the changing rooms fluffed up my chest and I was wearing my brand new Fred Perry t-shirt thingy and, and those tracksuits which for some reason tapered at the ankles with stirrups round the sides. All people will know what I'm talking about. Um, and I stood there feeling proud and I, I communicated with them. But instead of what I was hoping for, which was a gradual descending into silence, what I got instead was about 50 West London boys, all making a pretty poor attempt at a northern accent. <laughs> and I have to say, there's nothing worse than a southerner trying a northern accent, because frankly, you can't do it. Um, and they simply repeated what I said to them and then started laughing. So instead of the silence, what I got was, shut up, <laughs> shut up. 
And I have to say that was lesson number one in my career. Think about to whom you are communicating. Work out what it is you want to communicate and then and only then engage mouth. And I have to say that was the very first and the last time that I've ever told anybody to shut up. Um, so unfortunately, what I had to do was to go into the head of PE's office to solicit his support, which is a bit of a disappointment to me. So I went inside the office, only find, to find him sprawled across his office desk with his fist in his mouth and tears coming out of his eyes so that he didn't laugh quite as loud as the children in the changing rooms. Lesson number two, because when he was then eventually capable of coherent thought, he looked up at me and said, you need a sense of humour in this journey. <laughs> so, so after that, I, I, I really worked very, very hard on my communication skills. I knew that they were very important to me. And, uh, and I, I did actually get promotion very rapidly. And after about four years, I was the head of lower school which was in charge of the, what were then first and second years, we call them year seven and year eight now, but it's in charge of their general pastoral well-being and, um, uh, you know, their behaviour. And so I was appointed that position before I was 25. And when I look back at that, I, I, I think about myself and I realise just how desperately naive and innocent I was. But what I possessed at that time is what I see in our very best young teachers in school today, is I kind of had this, this armour of confidence which meant that nothing could permeate it. And it's quite interesting, it's quite interesting in a career because you, know, you begin with confidence up here and experience down there and you perform at that kind of level. But what does happen after 36 years of teaching is that confidence gets chipped away at and the, and the confidence levels come down. But the experience comes up to compensate for it and you still perform at, at, at a good level. But anyway, I thought I was a bee's knees in terms of communicating. Uh, in fact, I thought there was nobody better than me. And I recall um, one, one morning uh, a tutor came down to see me and he said, Richard, I can't be absolutely sure about this, but um, I think two of my tutor group skipped off from, from sports afternoon yesterday. He said, I know it's not a, you know, it's not a heinous crime, but I can't, uh, and I can't even be sure that they've done it, but I, I don't know what to do about it. So I said, send them to me. I'll sort it out. So minutes later, two young children uh, are at my door. And they knock and, and they come in, a boy and a girl, about 12, 13 years old, lovely kids. And they stood in front of me, sheepishly. And I thought, being the arch communicator, I said to myself, I'm now going to employ the noble bluff. So the children came in and I, I, I made the body language of, um, I know all about this. And I said to them, I, I said, I think we need to talk, don't we? And they looked at each other and looked at me and said, yes. So I said, look, I know what you've been up to, but I think it's probably better if you tell me all about it. And they nodded and said, yes. Yes, I think we should. So I said, OK, go on then, you can tell me about it. And they said, well, we did it. And I thought it was all easy, I thought, that one. I said, oh, I know that you did it. You just needed to tell me what it is. <laughs> and then they looked at each other again very sheepishly, they looked at me and said, sir, we stole the horse. <laughs> And when my heart started working again, <laughs> and I'd started breathing, I, I recovered myself really quite quickly and got the body language back and I said, oh, I know you stole the horse. I just need to hear about it. And they said, well, the missing horse that was on the front page of the informer. I said, I know that. 
other horse that was in the field adjacent to the school that was going to be taken to the abattoir and be put down. I know that, I said. I said, well, then we took it down the Great West Road, which is a six-lane carriageway, um, to some stables to have it housed. I said, I know that. And then he said, well, then we did it. I said, I know you did it. Just tell me what it was. And they said, well, that's when we had the raffle in school, pretending it was for the RSPCA. So we collected all the money in order to pay for its well-being and upkeep in the, in the stables. I said, well, it's good that you've been honest. <laughs> Can you wait outside? And then I thought, what the devil do I do now? Um, but interestingly, it was only an hour or two after that, and the, the older people in the audience will, will understand this, there was a notice put up in the staff room which said, Weeks has found Shergar. <laughs> and, then, and then not long after that, not long after that, the head teacher came shuffling over to me and he said, Richard, Richard, is this business about the horse true? I, I said, well, yes, it is. Ooh, he said, Ooh, it's a sorry business. I said, well, I know it is, but, you know, their motives were pretty wonderful, weren't they? And he said, oh, I'm not talking about that. He said, they got 50 pence out of me for the collection. So, um, so that was an occasion when, when uh, communication or miscommunication can work against you. I'd like to just tell you a little story now about how when miscommunication can work on your behalf. I'm not sure I should be proud of this story, but I think I'll, I think I'll do it anyway. It was a long time after I was in my first headship, and um, I'd just come back to school after having pretty major knee surgery. It was about operation number six of the 14 that I'd had uh, in, in my life. And I suspect that if I'd have been a little faster or more skillful as a rugby player, I could have avoided them all. Um, but I'd had my leg realigned because it was kind of poking out in a direction where it shouldn't have been. And they realigned it. And when they did that, they had to take all manner of bones and things out. And then I was given a, a, a plastic leg brace, very lightweight, very solid plastic, which went from thigh to ankle and had a metal to bend in the middle. And it was all held together with Velcro, which used to drive my wife crackers because it would rip. There was about 12 strips of the thing when I took it on and off. But the good thing about this piece of equipment is that you could wear it under a pair of trousers and it could hardly be seen. So that's what I did. And I was back in school for about three months wearing this thing. And then, and then on one occasion, a parent insisted on coming to see me because she said her child was being bullied. Well, I mean... <laughs> Kind of yes and no, really. It was, we'd already investigated. It would spend quite a bit of time on it. It was six in one and a half a dozen other. And it wasn't really a major issue. But the parent wanted to see me. So I said, that's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll have a chat. Uh, and she came in to see me, this, this lady. And we sat opposite each other. Um, with, I recall, no desk in between us, two, two, two chairs. And she, she went on and on and on about this situation and I did all the appropriate body language, yes, I, you know, that's okay, and, and, it was all, and I thought, we've probably come to the end really now, I've got other things to do and I've had this conversation. Uh, and then she said to me, and worst of all, Mr. Weeks, with a bit of a wag in there, worst of all, only yesterday now, he got pushed down in the playground outside and now he's got a really bad leg. And I said, oh, I am sorry. I do sympathise. And then she leant forward to me in a fairly aggressive manner and said to me, I don't think you do. And then the devil came over me. <laughs> and I leant forward to her and I tapped three times on my lightweight but very solid plastic leg brace. And I said, oh, I think I do. <laughs> And in an instant, you could see the thought bubble. My God, he's got a wooden leg. <laughs> and she stood up and said, Big Smart, thank you very much, Mr. You've done a wonderful job as a head teacher. My child is so happy in this school. I'm so pleased for all the things you do. And you'll never see me again. And she was gone. And to this day, I never saw her again. Um, I should, I should summarise. Um, 
In my 36 years, I have worked with some truly inspirational people. People uh, both on the teaching staff and the support staff. People who have uh, helped me and supported me and encouraged me and challenged me. And the very best of those people are, are those who are naturally wonderful communicators. And whether they're communicating to a single person or lots of people, whether it's the spoken word or the written word, these people can motivate people when they need it. They can encourage them, they can inspire them, they can lift them up. They can do all manner of things in order to support people and an organization. And when you have people like that in your organization, and I have them at Teddington in abundance, these are the people who achieve two things. First of all, they ensure that the aims and the objectives and the, and the success of the organization is improved. And the second thing they do is enhance the quality of the professional experience of individual people that they are working with. And finally, I would say that whilst um, I've talked about this from a teaching context, I don't think it matters in the slightest what career you have, what job, what profession, what status. I don't think it matters whether you're the partner in a business, in a multinational business, or whether you're the partner in a relationship. The key to success is communication. And I wonder actually if on the school curriculum we ought not to have more of communication skills as an opportunity for children to learn and to, de to develop. Finally, I would say, I hope that in a non too serious, non too boring and non too lengthy way, I have communicated my message to you, and if I haven't, then well, shut up. <laughs> Thank you very much.